like to begin with a land acknowledgement. We recognize that UC Berkeley sits on a territory of Wuchen, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyo speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Luwekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community, inclusion, and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to Native peoples. It's vitally important that we not only recognize the history of the land on which we stand, but also we recognize that the Muwekma Ohlone people are alive and flourishing members of the Berkeley and broader Bay Area communities today. Um, good morning, thanks for coming. Will you let me know if I start to run over because I don't have my timer now. This is a bit of a clunky arrangement. Hello to, greetings to all of you, greetings to everyone in Zoom land. Um, thanks to everyone who's made this event possible to Melody, our organizer, and to all those whose labor is less visible. I'm excited and privileged as well to share the program with someone whose work I deeply admire, Savannah Wood, who will be, uh, her talk will follow mine. And I'm going to talk uh, through a mask, so not too garbled about my lost landscape project. This arose out of the film archives I started in the 1980s, and now that I co-manage, I'll be talking about how the project works, about moving images as documentation of the every day and the every place, about presenting it to communities and soliciting their participation, and about the positionalities of the archivist and presenter. And I wanna pitch the value as well as the excitement of public assembly, as opposed to building al algorithmically based projects using code, browsers, social media. I'm gonna end with a mini rant about what I call over narrativization, presenting some history, some alternatives and some warnings. Um, I'd also like to say, I'll put these slides up on SlideShare. So you don't need to take notes on what I'm saying unless you'd like to. Um, the origin of most of my projects come out of my archival. I've collected many thousands of films, what I call useful cinema, films with a job to do, as opposed to films that entertain. I sold stock footage to support the archives. I traveled around the world doing public screenings. The films were made to promote products, companies, government agencies and ideas that were made to manufacture and sustain consensus in the US from the 1910s through the 1970s. Taken together, they're a deep record of how moving images were weaponized to divide people by race, gender, ethnicity, class, age, ability, and more. But they're also amazing records of daily life and culture. I also collected home movies. And over the last 10 or 12 years, most of my archival work has revolved around these amazing records. Home movies are both deeply granular about small things, small moments, and filled with commonalities, perhaps even cliches. But they're also deeply detailed and vivid, really vivid records of daily life, culture, labor, and ceremonies. And on a more profound level, they're testimonies to resilience and survival. When 16 millimeter home movies were introduced in 1923, they were an expensive toy. It cost about 1400 in today's dollars to shoot and develop an hour of film, compare that to an hour of smartphone video. And we see mainly wealthy people. But when eight millimeter is introduced in 1933, we suddenly see this flowering of home movie expression. We see working class families, we see families of color, we see rural and farm families. We see kids making movies. And this is a trajectory that over time leads us to home video uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, and to our, our smartphones today. We don't know, this is somewhere in either San Diego or LA, but my detective work hasn't, hasn't helped yet. For a time, I felt like an angry archivist. 
or at least a disappointed archivist, because images from my archives were propagated widely in the media, but they rarely had a chance to ride solo. They were clipped short. They were shown with overbearing narration, emotionally invasive music. They were deployed not for the evidence they contained or the, their formative ambiguity. Let's see some more of them. Um, but the images were used to serve as narrative glue, as continuity fixes, as eye candy. And the idea that archival material might prompt audiences to uh, learn to watch and listen in a deeper way, to view ourselves as historical beings, this was suppressed. Bits and pieces from our collection were being woven into works that weakened and often trivialized their components. Um, I hope, and I still hope, that archives could speak for themselves, or if not completely for themselves, without too many filters. So I made laser discs, CD-ROM film anthologies with contextual materials and a little three-inch grit suggesting critical perspectives. Uh, I worked with Internet Archives to build an online digital collection which grew to 8,000 items, and I made screening. The, in 1991, I was invited to Britain, South Dakota, which is a town of about 1,400 that, uh, to show home movies from that town in 1938-39 in a local theater. And to keep a long story short, the town had survived. The theater had survived. Many people in the films were still there and saw themselves on the screen. The shooter, a man named Ivan Bessie was there. And until then, I'd never seen European Americans talk back to the movie screen. And then in 2006, I began making urban history documentary events, which is the main thing I wanna talk about today. I've made 27 of them, different ones in San Francisco, in Oakland, in New York, in LA, and Detroit. Um, events that have presented been presented about 110 times to about 50,000 people live. This fall, I'm going to do infrastructure of California, uh, taking on the whole state, earth, air, fire, and water. These are, are barely plotted events, often called lost landscapes. They take public assembly and mass dialogic presence, and they try to mobilize audiences to produce their own narrative of the moment on the fly. How's that work? So to speak very simply, I show intricately assembled and lightly edited footage, especially parts of home movies, to audiences who talk to one another in the dark while the movie's playing. These are all really DIY projects. I'm fortunate to have access to extensive archives. Everything you see today will come from our archives. And there are many community contributions of footage and I can scan film for free. I edit myself and the budgets are very, very low. The audience, um, the audience uh, is there to ask questions, to make remarks, to talk back to the screen and to each other, to engage in spirited conversations and disputes and so on. Um, this is an image that was made as a background process plate for a movie, you know, in old movies, you know, you're in a cab and you see people are in a cab and you see the street going by, that's what this is. Um, is there storytelling in these events? Sort of, the images are often arranged geographically, um, spatially, sometimes topically. These, these events are often a trip through a city. There's a measure of causality. Some segments are nested inside one another. But in general, the audience, who's often quite familiar with the places in the film, makes their own narrative out of the pieces. As they watch and they participate, they build a set of multiple co-equal consensuses around historical evidence that can be read in multiple ways. That is, it works. Um, unlike most films, these are made for noisy audiences. These are dialogical encounters where I work with audiences to set some of the terms for discussion. And unlike most of the documentaries that are being made now that call themselves interactive or participatory, you know, you film people if you are, will know that this is a big trend in documentary, interactive, participatory. But these don't use the algorithm. These are realized through public assembly, through people physically together in one place. They don't use browsers, apps, social media, platforms, code to connect viewers. They just use the human voice. Um, I should be clear that this project 
I didn't think this up in advance. I didn't know what my mission was. It's been finding its own way for 15 years more. And while I used to see it as a radical practice, I now see it as radically traditionalist. I'm a live MC. I'm encouraging audiences to raise their voices in real time. This is the kind of behavior that's been policed out of movie theaters. But it's actually an echo of super traditional practices. Some of you may know about the, the, the pits of the Elizabethan theater that were populated by rowdy groundlings who would make no secret of their um, what they thought of the plays and the actors. This is a highly engaged form of audience interactivity. And later on, um, there's evidence that the theatrical space functioned as a virtual stage onto which racially integrated audiences, despite laws prohibiting that, perform social relations. Elizabeth Maddox Dillon, in her book, New World Drama, writes about how after the commons were uh, taken away from the common people by the gentry, those lands were remapped into the space of the theater. So 18th and early 19th century audience members didn't just go to the theater to see a play, they went to represent themselves, to make common space, an often common cause. In 1804, a writer in Boston complains that the theater is too dark during the show, because people are there to see each other, not just for the performance. And when Richard III is performed at the Bowery Theater in New York in 1832, over 300 audience members swarm the stage to assist in killing the tyrannical king. And in 1920s, Bertolt Brecht spoke of the sports audience, particularly the boxing audience as the ideal audience for his epic theater. Such audiences, he said, are highly knowledgeable and aware, uninhibited, vocal, opinionated, keen observers who keep their eyes on the course rather than their eyes on the finish. Um, Urban geographies, kind of what does that mean? Is it just, you know, streets, is it buildings? I think of a continuum, really. There's a, that ranges from public places and public environments like streets, like parks, like stadia, to private and intimate geographies. Um, this is Los Angeles Union Station in 1939, just after it was finished. Across the plaza is the old Mission Church, and here's a Mexican family wedding there in 1947. So this is, you know, four years after the Zutsu riots in Los Angeles. So this beautiful clip um, that you just saw was made uh, was made to be seen in a small on a small screen in a small environment, a family environment. But we when we see it on a big screen, it provokes a kind of change of roles in the audience. The audience may not be expecting it, but they become more than simple commentators. They gain a new kind of agency. They turn into ethnographers who remark on every visible detail of kinship, word, gesture, every interpersonal exchange. They wonder who's paired up with whom. They respond as cultural geographers. They call out streets, neighborhoods, buildings. They read signs aloud. Let's see that again. Uh, they repeat trade names and brands. They mark uh, extinct details in the cityscape. Really, you know, if you could capture their voices, this would read like a giant urban research project. Here's a... Um, uh, upper middle class family who's just built their house uh, or is building their house outside Columbus. Now it's within the city of Columbus and she's shooting with her SLR. You know, one film is never the same to all audience members. I urge people in these screens to focus on the future rather than the past, but there is a conflict between people who look forward and people who look backward. And that conflict doesn't always lead to discussion. Um, it depends on the city, the composition, the audience and their mood, but it's a formative conflict, you know, um, talk more about that. This um, sequence is from film made by Oswald Sykes, a black man who was a hospital administrator who fought to bring inclusion to his professional association, the National 
Rehabilitation Association. Here they're meeting in San Francisco in 1969. Um, the man you just saw and you'll see again is Earl Caldwell. He was a reporter for the New York Times who covered the trial of Angela Davis. This is Mr. Caldwell. He embedded himself with the Black Panther Party and he covered the native occupation of uh, Alcatraz Island for uh, days and days and days. Um, I have found that when I show my films in Detroit, black and white Detroiters often see very different films. And there's a vexing contradiction when you present this very detailed granular evidence because the local history consciousness is often a filter. And a lot of people throw up detail as a defense against dealing with irreconcilable or tough questions. People a lot of times focus on the specifics, but not the generalities. This, by the way, is the, the bass tub fishing vessel that was uh, chartered to, um, to, uh, to, uh, to shuttle native occupiers uh, from and to Alcatraz Island. The son of the skipper is still around, by the way, and, and really love this film. So uh, for occupiers and for their dynasties, um, the details can distract from the fact of occupation. Um, I see the cities I work in, San Francisco, Detroit, Oakland, LA, are cities of extreme contestation, cities where battles were fought to uh, maintain racialized power and control. The Detroit phone book from 1964 under realtors is racially coded as part of the, uh, the construction of black and white neighborhoods in Detroit and the block busting that was occurring in the 60s as a precursor to the 1967 rebellion. Not everyone wants to recall how African-Americans have been priced out and redeveloped out of my city, San Francisco, um, or how Asian families were prohibited for li from living on the west side of the city for many years. And so with local history, you got to watch that granular detail, because for some people, it will screen out uncomfortable issues. But on the other hand, place-based evidence can be actionable. It can be reparative. Stories do not have to put a stop to history. Stories do not have to glorify conquest or occupation. Uh, and in fact, I quit working in Detroit after doing five um, events there. While I worked closely with people from Detroit and was privileged to use their footage, um, the settler thing in Detroit is so intense right now, I just, I have to, to go. That project needs to turn into a community-based project. I've started to try to repatriate it. And you know, a lot of people want to show the films, but it's more than that. It's not about the film. I mean, I think this is one of the key things I have to say. These projects are not about the product, they're about the process. The screenings are not ends, but they're means. Um, Savannah Wood is doing this kind of work in Baltimore and elsewhere. I hope she talks about that. I'd like to see Lost Landscapes as a community project where work happen mostly at the neighborhood level where maybe younger makers could connect with elders to find images. We were just talking about this to explicate them, to identify people's uh, pictures, to put together presentations that happen locally. So shifting the emphasis from a one-time event to enabling a process is a really wonderful a way to relocate historical agency away from filmmakers who honestly don't really deserve it because filmmakers are serial monogamous. You know, they get deeply involved in one project and then when the next project comes along, you know, they, they, it's a light switch. Filmmakers are given a little too much historical agency in my opinion. And that is my positionality, which is a real issue. I constantly have to ask, who am I to speak about these cities and recall these lives. Because to interpolate oneself as a teller or a reteller or a channeler of other people's histories is to construct a pedestal. And that's often a pedestal of privilege. So in general, um, I've come to think of these events, especially ones that take place outside my own city where I have some, some stakes as seeds in a process that I only assist. I'm a scout, I'm a presenter. I'm not an interpreter, I'm not an authority. I make very clear to Detroiters, for example, that the future of their city is theirs to decide, theirs to struggle for. These images, this is one of my favorite home movies ever. This is historic. Um, 
the images are to support discussions which belong to them. And of course, I make the programs online so that they can be remixed and reused. Um, in the long run, maybe not so long, these images need to be repatriated because communities and community archives are the real heirs to this evidence. Um, there are real questions to ask, for example, should white archives control uh, the historical record of communities of color. This is a very, very difficult question. A lot of white archives have the money to outbid, you know, other institutions. And I think it's a, it's a, a messy problem that really needs to be talked about a lot more. I'm gonna ask your leave now to speak a moment about what we are calling storytelling. Our former librarian of Congress, James Billington, often said, Stories unite people, theories divide them. I always thought this was funny because I wanted it to be the other way around. Stories divide people, theories unite them. But um, almost everybody in the businesses of media history and museums, I use the word business intentionally, obsessively emphasizes this word story. It repeats how basic story is to our humanity. And there's so much anxiety. It's like, uh, I don't know, it's like, it's like the obsessive thanking of, of people for their military service, which a lot of that critique. Where does all that anxiety come from? Story rules us, story is in control. But if it was as deeply ingrained in all of our consciences, consciousnesses as the storytellers claim it is, we wouldn't have to pledge allegiance so often. So the word I'm using today is over narrativization. This isn't necessarily to take a stand against story or beyond story, but certainly against too much story. Um, at the same time, I wanna remember that what we call storytelling has progressive, even radical origins in the 1930s, a revival of folk culture and the workerist left helped build awareness of narratives by and about rural and working class people. Workers from the WPA and the New Deal were paid to collect the life stories of formerly enslaved people, although that was a deeply problematic project, but it still happened. Um, Storytelling's interpretive capabilities were posed as a radical alternative to mass culture. And in the 70s, a lot of people appropriated these techniques from the 30s, thinking about radical narrativity as part of a toolbox of revolutionary cultural practices. And there was also just a growing understanding that the personal was the political. And so storytelling also became a key practice within second wave feminism. So um, to accompany this really beautiful footage of uh, Wyam, Salayo Falls, I wanna tell you that this was an important center for um, native trade and culture and ceremony. This is 11 miles east of the Dalles in Oregon, 11 miles east, by the way, of a big Google data center that is built to use the cheap hydropower from the Columbia River. For at least 11,000 years, tribes came from the region and as far away as the Great Plains here to trade and celebrate the annual fall and spring salmon returns. Um, this happened, fishing happened until 1957 when the Dallas Dam was built, flooded and inundated the falls. The federal government relocated Salilo Village, which was a, a place where people lived and traded um, and compensated native people and tribes with $26 million for their cultural and academic loss, economic loss, but many leaders protested and many people think there was no, uh, no money was sufficient to replace the falls. Descendants of the native families who fished here continue to fish on the river and perform the traditional salmon ceremonies of their ancestors. My late father-in-law, who was not native, hung out here, rode those, um, rode that, uh, that zip line, and was present when President Nixon dedicated the dam. We need to preserve and protect and honor narratives that represent survival, resistance, relationship to land, place, other species that inhabit the earth, but at the same time, let's not force documents and evidence into artificial narratives, especially narratives that are determined by what's commercially or artistically in vogue today. Um, we don't need to perpetuate narratives of violence, bias, and white supremacy. And if we, res to respect the form as well as the substance, 
of sacred stories or stories that are valued by communities, that may mean not trying to force them into storytelling frameworks that are dictated quite often by mass culture. Um, if we think about archives and how we can daylight them, let's think beyond what we already know about storytelling. Are we taking materials that have a non-narrative nature and then identifying, contextualizing, geocoding them towards the goal of making new narratives? This is safe and predictable territory. But I think we should think carefully about trying to squeeze um, rarely seen evidence that comes from new places that we've not been before into old fashioned containers that may not be very useful. So some things I've learned. Um, narrative is packaging at worst, and many other films, many kinds of media are already fairly arbitrary assemblies of emotional triggers. Um, a good yarn leaves its own spark. It needs no excessive trim. Documentation can be its own narrative. If you walk through a cemetery, the stones, let's get rid of that, the stones suggest stories. And we're often drawn to think of the communities in which deceased people live. This is the part where families didn't have money to maintain to the, um, the graves. So this is where working class and poor people are. Go visit it sometime in Oakland. Um, the enigmas in this section are especially telling. There's so many ways people have made narratives who could and built narratives without reverting to conventional storytelling. Um, Here's a list of the prisoners who sought medical attention at the tombs in August 1944. These are doctors noting, and you can, if you look through this book, which you can come see in our library, many uh, prisoners describe police violence. And always in that book, it says claims, so on. Marge Piercy, in this wonderful passage, I won't bother to read it, but she talks about different personal geographies. This paragraph is really a film treatment. Um, human habitation, uh, human, humans and nature, and uh, political struggle, three different ways to think about landscape. Here's an all future. This is the Soviet military map of the San Francisco Bay Area. See, we're here in Bietli up there. Um, quilts, you know, are, are incredible in terms, of, uh, in terms of narrative, in terms of memory, in terms of assemblage of narratives using these interchangeable squares. And home movies, you know, home movies help to address this problem of over-narrativization because every home movie is at the minimum a capsule narrative. It articulates a relationship between the shooter and who or what is being shot. And many home movies are even more complex. There's all these issues of identification and intimacy. Um, and so a lot of times home movies don't really need more than themselves. New Year's. Um, structure isn't inevitably a necessary part of the story either. It's really the way the audience approaches the work, in my opinion. Could we locate narrative intelligence in the audience? rather than in the work itself, to use a cybernetic anthology, put the data in the movie, but rely on viewers to execute the code to interpret it in their own way. A man who was a pioneer in putting news online many years ago, Bill Dunn, uh, said the metadata exceeds the importance of the data it describes. Let people build their own metadata. Maybe it's our job to offer viewers strategies for sentience and rewards for decoding. Maybe we should treat viewers at least part of the time like gamers, you know, with lives to gain. Maybe our work should resemble the internet the way it was originally designed to be, which is smart at the periphery, smart among our viewers and our community, dumb at the center, locate the narrative intelligence with the audience rather than trying to cram it all into work and ask viewers to ride along. Who is the center? What is the center? Is it the work? or is it the viewers? So these are not models, these are provocations, right? We can't deny the importance of story, but we can stop short of saying that it's internal. We can insist that story and storytelling is culturally specific, that it's historically specific. Every one of us comes out of communities that sees and tells stories differently. We can resist trying to force the non-human 
into human frames. We can let go the idea that most human narratives are containable within media. Not all stories are filmable. Not all stories fit within the glowing rectangle. Some could remain embedded in individual and collective memory and body and landscape and fauna and earth. And some, as the futurists are telling us, belong to other temporalities. And in the archives world now, there's a great, a big tendency people saying, you know, some things just aren't part of archives, don't belong in archives. So look, I don't seek to bury the algorithm, but I do, I question any retreat from public assembly. We've had to do it for a year and a half. Um, but interactive cinema, a lot of that retreats all the time. Um, the difficulties of realizing a truly participatory commons in a world that's unequally provisioned shouldn't prevent us from doing low tech person to person experimentation. We're not always gonna be able to build virtual spaces that rely on programmers, sysadmins, code and connectivity. And if we, and I'm gonna argue that if we can restore collective big screen experience and build direct participation into it, this is a way to stage the meeting of difference without diluting it, a means to an end rather than the end in itself. And so I end by saying, look, public assembly, what ends could it serve? You know, when you lead people to gather in the room for a film, an arts event, a presentation, but especially a film, you could do so much more. It seems like getting people together to watch something is just the beginning. Uh, could we stimulate audiences to take on greater agency, new responsibilities? Could a screening be a model for deeper participation, for collective efforts to remediate conditions that we can't do, we can't do individually. Um, could we model a new commons within the, the space of the works that we show? And, um, and thank you. If you wanna see any of these things, you can go to prelinger.com, which is where they are. And uh, thanks for your attention. And I think you'll introduce Savannah. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, we'll have Savannah present and then we can do questions for both at the end. So, should I cut out? Yeah, can you stop sharing screen? Savannah. Can we do uh, Savannah? So Savannah Wood joins us on Zoom today, um, based in the Baltimore area. Hi, Savannah. Savannah is an artist and cultural organizer, um, and she's done a myriad projects. Right now, she's working with the Afro American Newspapers, which is the um, which has been a weekly newspaper um, and is the longest running black newspaper in the United States, established in 1892. Um, Savannah will be telling us about two projects, one of them um, both created um, in conjunction with the archives. The first is called To the Front, Black Woman and the Vote. Um, and then the second is a current work in progress. Um, so we are really excited to have Savannah join us and to continue the conversation on working with community archives. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for having me, Rick. Um, you ended on such an, uh, a wonderful set of provocations, which I'm definitely taking with me after this. Um, Melody, thank you for having me today, and thanks to everybody who's here. I did kind of switch things up a little bit, so I will talk about the two projects you mentioned, but um, when Melody originally reached out, hold on one second, let me stop share for a second and make sure I did sound too. Okay. Uh, when Melody originally reached out, the question that came to me was to potentially do an overview of lots of projects that have kind of led me to where I am now. So um, we're going to start there, actually. And then from there, I'll go into more depth about the second project that she spoke about, um, which is ongoing right now. And she also asked me for a title. And this is always really difficult for me. And then one morning, I was like, well, this is what came to me. So this is what we're going with. And it's one of the longest titles I think I've ever come up with, but it's follow the thread, pull the thread, thread the needle, patchwork projects towards a funerary quilt. And so I can talk about this a little bit. We're dealing with three idioms in the first part, 
which all kind of have to deal with um, how we interpret information, how we work with information. So to follow the thread is to follow something to its logical end, to follow along with a series of concepts, to pull the thread could potentially be asking questions to unravel something that already exists. Um, and to thread the needle is the one that requires probably the most amount of skill, I would assume, which is you know really to navigate um, complex ideas and to reach a harmonious end. So this is kind of the framework that I'll use for this presentation today. And so when I talk about patchwork projects, we're gonna go over several projects that are maybe related, we'll see how they connect. And then the funerary quilt, when I'm dead, I hope that all these projects will speak for themselves. Rick talked a little bit about um, quilting as an amazing form of storytelling. So if we think of the projects as patches, um, these are interchangeable ways of telling a story about my life and interests. So follow the thread. This is about discovery and pursuing very interests. And I'll start just by giving a little bit of um, biographical in information as a way of grounding this and because it plays into the projects that I'm working on. So, you know, I grew up in a two parent household, fairly well off, youngest of four kids, family of artists and entrepreneurs, and with my father's constant encouragement to follow your curiosity, to follow the thread. And I bring this up because as I go through these projects, you'll see that I've landed at some smaller nonprofit organizations. And the reason why I was able to work there is because I knew I wasn't going to go hungry. They couldn't pay a lot, but they paid me enough and I got a valuable learning experience out of those um, experiences. So I actually can kind of say that I went to UC Berkeley as a preschooler. I was at Jones Child Study Center, and that's where I made my very first book. Um, we moved to Baltimore in about 95, where I was a theater major eventually at Baltimore School for the Arts and switched because of following this thread, following my interests into theater production, where I would learn how to sew, how to build sets, and ultimately how to construct um, complex projects or to take a, a play and break apart its pieces and figure out what we needed to create to create the context for this thing. I went to University of Southern California where I studied photography as well as minors in French and entrepreneurship. And the French minor allowed me to study abroad in Paris for a semester. And I mentioned this because while I was in Paris was when I started to really have um, formative experiences that would shape my understanding of race, which would become a, a part of how I entered my projects moving forward. And so being within a US context for my entire life, I had one perception of who I was in relation to the world. And then going to Paris where there's a long storied history of black Americans spending time there, it felt very different. And so when I, I returned back to USC, I was in a senior photo um, class with Sharon Lockhart where she charged us to make artist books. And so my book was called No Longer in Use, which makes reference to an anthropological definition of race where they said the division of these races are no longer in use, but we know obviously in the US they still are. And so the book opens with a portrait and then you have to further engage with it to open the page again in order to see how people describe themselves. So you come with your own assumptions to the project, open it up, see how somebody would define themselves. And in this way, dealing with two different modes of information with the image and with the um, text and with your own assumptions as well. From there at USC, I also met a great deal of artists who were also starting to grapple with some of these ideas. We formed a collective called Native Thinghood where we aim to promote um, other black artists in Los Angeles in particular. Through that, we did um, exhibitions. We hosted a film showcase with Terrence Nance, Ben Caldwell, Khalil Joseph, Akosa Odoma. We had um, the premiere screening of Black Radical Imagination which is a project by Amir George and Aaron Cristoval. And it has toured all over the world for the past several years, um, but it got its start with us at Native Thinghood. So in my last year of school, as I was graduating, my uncle moved to Brazil and I was very curious about it. So I, I booked a ticket and spent some time there. And the most important thing that happened was meeting an artist named Denise Milan, um, whose work is pictured here. And the reason why it was important, she, she does a lot of work that's like about nature, about the earth, anthropomorphizing stones to some degree, um, but also really like looking at their own inherent qualities. So on the left are all of these um, amethyst geodes, but she also was working on an exhibition in Chicago, which is the image on the right is from that exhibition. And she invited me upon coming back to the US to spend some time working on her, this project with her. 
So we spent hours with several other artists in Chicago, hand cutting out with, you know, um, exacto knives, these images to make these collages that were then presented in that show. And I mentioned that because going to Chicago for that two week period, I was really excited by the fact that artists could seemingly make a living there, um, could make enough of a living to, you know, exist comfortably, that rent was super cheap. And there seemed to be a really thriving artist community. So later that year, I moved to Chicago. And through a series of events, <laughs> happened to meet the Astor Gates, like right as he was coming on his ascension. Um, so he is an artist who's based in Chicago, who has founded the Rebuild Foundation. He's um, very much place-based in his work where a lot of it is based in buildings, in fact, and re you know, kind of um, renovating buildings to be cultural centers. So on the left, you see the Stony Island Arts Bank, which is on Stony Island Avenue in Chicago. And this incredible library that was um, compiled by the Johnson Publishing Company, which produced Ebony and Jet Magazine. Um, so while working there, I was working on a project that's similar to what's pictured on the left for the Astor, which was assembling this library of black books that would eventually go to a private collector. And as I'm working on it, I was like, oh my God, this is such a shame. You know, I wish we could have these books available for people who are here, who are just in the neighborhood. And so, you know, following that line of thought, I created a project called Black Ink Book Exchange, which is on the right, which is an exchange library. And so people could come in, take a book, leave a book on the right. Um, you would write down your exchange. And this sort of became like, you know, the exchanges became sort of a map of what people were interested in, what they were reading, what they found, what they were willing to give up. And it moved from location to location in Chicago um, during the summer of 2014. And on the left, um, we invited several artists to come in and spend time with the books and to do some kind of project that would use the books and engage people. So in this one, Jamila Woods is in the middle and she's leading a um, songwriting workshop. So you would take a, a line from one of the books and build a song from there. Also through the Rebuild Foundation was my first real um, introduction to archives. And so, you know, I think it was 20, 13 or so, the Esther acquired a collection from a couple, Ed and Anna Williams. And over the past 40 years, they had been collecting what he referred to as Negrobilia, which is like racist caricature items that were produced mostly in the United States, but also there were a few that came from Japan or Germany and they had a massive collection. And so over the course of several months, I was in an apartment that was refitted as an office space <laughs> Go pouring over all of these objects with a woman who was from London, but I believe she was of French and Malian descent, and a woman who was from the suburbs of Chicago who was white, and me dealing with all of these racist objects. And we had to describe them, photograph them, and create a catalog. So on the left, you have an example of some of the things that were there. And on the right is an image of um, four volumes that were created from the work that we did. And the one that's back here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but towards the top left of the right image is, you know, the spreadsheets that we made to really just catalog everything that's there. And I mentioned the racial background of everybody and where they were coming from because it really provided an interesting perspective on these objects and what we were handling, uh, what they came from. So the woman who was from London was coming from a different racial context altogether where she had so many questions <laughs> about why these things were. And I had kind of taken them for granted because I just knew they existed. And then the white woman from Chicago is like trying to explain things but has no way to do it. And so it became like a really interesting dynamic in the room as we're processing this collection. But I was the main one writing these descriptions. And so it also introduced the idea of um, descriptive harm that can be caused but how do you describe a racist object without using racist language? You know, it's hard to do. How do you how do you say this is a mammy without saying it's a mammy? And so whenever anybody comes to look through this collection, it's like that's that's what you're confronted with in the object and in the description. But it got me thinking about archives and the way that they're organized. Okay, so all of that was sort of just like following along the things that came up, serendipitous occasions, things that just happened to happen. <laughs> and asking questions because I wanted access, but not because I was really thinking super critically about them. But after three unbearably cold winters in Chicago, I moved back to Los Angeles and got a job with an organization called Clock Shop. 
So this is where I would say we started pulling the thread a little bit more and trying to unravel some things. So one of Clock Shop's main programming sites um, is called the Bowtie Project. And it's an 18 acre piece of land that the Cal California State Parks owns. It's a former rail yard and it's situated right on the LA River, which you can see kind of in the left here. Mountains are here, um, the 110 freeway, the five freeway, the two freeway kind of triangulate around this site as well. So it's at a point of intersection in the city. And if you know anything about Los Angeles, you know that you know the city was founded by the river. And so it has this historical importance to the city of LA, but it's a very odd site that's sort of in limbo and kind of continues to be. But through Clock Shop, we um, were able to have a partnership with California State Parks to program this site. And so we did a series of artist commissions and you know, environmental workshops, all kinds of things out there. So on the left is artist Rafa Esparza's performance at the site on top of a, an excavated sculpture by another artist whose name is escaping me right now. And on the right is an herbarium that was created by Nancy Clem um, and, you know, an ecological forager. And so we did these um, projects just to kind of investigate the site through many different lenses. So you see that there's an herbarium here, but we also did documentary series. We did um, historical context on the site. We started a program called Bowtie Youth Council where young people who are in high school and middle school would learn about the ecological um, assets at the site basically and map all that stuff, be able to do storytelling events there. So it was really coming at this location from all of these different um, media, if you will. In addition to that, um, Today, California State Parks has gotten the funding to be able to start planning the, um, I guess you would call it like the renovation of the land. So they're gonna make it more of like a park park instead of um, a concrete slab, which is mostly what it is, although it's really beautiful as is as well. Um, and so Clock Shop has been very much involved in the advocacy around that site and making sure that um, folks who live in the neighborhood have a say in what comes next. Also at Clock Shop, we did a project called Radio Imagination, which is um, a second archival investigation for me, um, which dealt with Octavia E. Butler's um, archive that's at the Huntington Library in San Marino, a suburb of Los Angeles. And this is uh, more of a commonplace practice today, but I don't know that it was at the time, um, but we invited artists and writers to spend time with this collection and create some new work. And so on the left are the writers who were involved Robin Cost Lewis, Linnell George, Tisa Bryant, and Fred Moten. And then on the right are the artists who made new work um, for the project. In addition to these commissions, um, we also created a suite of public programming that also was quite as varied as what we did at the Bowtie. So there's performance, there was lectures by um, biologists who were digging into Octavia Butler's science fiction work and where her theories were coming from. So it was a very deep investigation into this um, collection of a black woman science fiction writer who's from Los Angeles. So with all of these projects, there is a location-based um, element to it where you know, we talked a lot internally about the fact that Octavia Butler as a black writer didn't give her papers to the Schomburg. She chose to give them to the Huntington. And there's something there about the physical location and how centrally it plays out in her fiction and how her, um, her papers and her books really relate to place as well. And so to be able to access them in a place that you know, looks like this types of stuff that she's referencing is really powerful. And at the same time, um, as Rick brought up earlier, you know, it's a white institution holding this black woman's papers. And so one of the writers actually was like, you know, I really hated being there. I felt really creeped out being in the archives. So I did as little research as I could. She said, I pulled a few things. And then I just wrote a love letter to Octavia Butler basically. And it was, it was really beautiful what she came up with. In addition to those commissions and in addition to the public programming, we also produced a um, catalog, which is on the left, which I edited and then a podcast that also dug into her legacy, which is on the right. And I was a co-host for this. So through all of these projects and working for these other organizations, I'm building up my repertoire, my skill set of how to approach different projects and what media to use and how to tell these stories. So from here, I'm thinking like, what gets better than, 
gets better than being able to do research into Octavia Butler's archive and like make this cool podcast and make this book and work with all these artists. What else could I be doing here? You know, and the only way to really move up in that organization at that point would have been to become the executive director. And I'm like, I'm not really sure I want to actually do that. Uh, that's not really for me. But I recalled that my family had founded um, a black newspaper in Baltimore. And I was like, I wonder what kind of archives we have. I'd never even thought about it before. I wonder what kind of archives we have. And so I was able to get a grant to move back to Baltimore to start investigating that. And so here are my great, great grandparents, John H. Murphy Sr. and Martha Elizabeth Howard Murphy, and an early copy of the Afro-American newspaper, which at the time was a four page paper. Um, and it's still in print today and it's still online today. But I've always been told that they're the founders. Well, actually I've been told that John is the founder of the newspaper. And recently I learned that Martha loaned him the money to start the paper. And I'm thinking, where did this black woman get the equivalent of $5,000 to just give to her husband to do this thing? And then as I kept digging, you know, pulling the thread, if you will, um, I started to unravel the rest of the story. And it's her, her father was a wealthy landowner, former slave. That's also really curious. How did that happen? Um, but he, when he died, she was an inherited portion of the land and sold her portion of the land to her brother and had the money to loan to her husband, not to found the paper, but in fact to buy it. And so this story that I'd been told my whole life of them being the founders was actually not quite true. So they ended up buying the newspaper in 1897, five years after it was founded, because it started to fail at that point. And the money came from um, Martha's father's death and the subsequent sale of a piece of land. And so I mentioned that I got a grant earlier to come back here. And the organization that gave me that grant was um, is called the Deutsch Foundation, which actually purchased the building that's right here, which is the former Afro building. So you'll see on the left, there's an image that was taken basically like right when we moved back to Baltimore of me and my cousin on the front of this building. This one on the right is you know several years later. And this is now the Deutsch Foundation building, which is the foundation that funded me to come back. So here are some images from the archives just so you have a sense that comprises about 3 million photographs, most of which have captions on the back of them, which help us to understand what's going on in the image. Um, they're also, you know, written contemporaneous to, contemporaneously to generally with the actual image. And so it's um, a caption that's from that moment of the image that's there as opposed to reflecting back on it. Um, these are several paper boys and girls who, you know, worked for the newspaper selling papers. This is the advertising department in the 1930s. And in the front, you can see this is basically like the Afro's version of the Negro, um, the green, the green book, rather the Negro Traveler's Guide. And in the back is a portrait of my great great grandfather. And then there's these mnemonic tubes that were used to send briefs around the office. This is what the collection looks like currently. And there's lots of things in lots of boxes and past archivists for the paper have done really an amazing job at getting the majority of this collection catalog. So at least it's searchable down to a folder level. And part of what I'm thinking about as I'm looking at these images and continuing with this theme of pulling the thread is like, how do we, <laughs> how do we make this even more accessible? Right now we're in a temporary location, coronavirus has messed things up, we can't really welcome researchers. So how do we build capacity in order to give people access to this collection of world history that's told from a Black perspective? These are all um, bound volumes of the newspaper. So they'll take an entire year of the paper and bind it into a large book. That's what all of these are stacked here. There were 13 different editions up and down the East Coast. So it's not just Baltimore, it's DC, it's Richmond, Virginia, Newark, all over the place. And it even extended to other parts of the world through you know, people's travels who worked for the paper, things came back into the archives tantalizing objects like this that just say Martin Luther King speech, <laughs> which we have recently gotten digitized. And this is an image of just children playing um, in 1930 in Druid Hill Park. This is a glass lantern slide that was taken in Haiti. I don't know the exact date here, but it might've been during the American occupation of Haiti. This is a street in Baltimore and um, some original cartoons. There was a cartoonist who worked for the paper for 40 years named Thomas Stockett. And what 
strikes me about this is that all some of the things that are here, some of the themes are just so relevant today. So part of the way that I'm thinking about how we give people access in the interim and moving forward is again, sort of replicating projects that we've done in the past, but you know, this is how we're, we're playing with it. So how do you bring all this collection into the present? Do you, do you contextualize it? And now I have Rick in my head saying, don't over narrat narrativize everything. Um, but one of the projects that we did was this one that Melody mentioned, just called To the Front, Black Women in the Vote. And it came out in 2020, um, the year of the centennial of the passage and ratification rather of the um, 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote. And so in these two spreads, we really had to dig deep into the archives in order to pull these women out. Most of the time they were classified under their husband's name, which again goes back to how things are categorized and how you're able to surface information based on those categorizations. So if we were going through now, you know, that was a convention of the time, but if we were to recategorize these things now, I would put their names on it, obviously, so it makes it easier to find them. Um, and then we also included some images from the or late 50s and mid 60s, which showed, you know, when the majority of Black people actually were able to vote, because leading up to 1920, you know, there were certain areas where Black people could vote, but there was still a whole lot of racial terror that kept people from that. And so in addition to pulling things directly from the archives, we also conducted interviews with people who, you know, were working on similar topics. Dr. Martha Jones is a professor at Hopkins, and she had just written a book called Vanguard, which is all about Black women's political organizing for over the past 200 years, which was coming out that fall. So this is an interview with her. And then these are um, newspaper clippings that came from the newspaper with some just very brief contextualization underneath them. Another project um, that is seeking to bring these archives into the present in a way and to engage people in you know, seeing them, looking at them, seeing where there might be value for them. Um, it's called Close Read. And so this involved three artists. I included myself in it because I learned all this really interesting information about my great grandmother, my great great grandmother and the founding of the paper. And I wanted to talk about that too. Um, but it was projected onto the front of the old Afro building, which you saw earlier, which is now the Deutsche Foundation building. And so this is um, a projection from Akia Brown. And her project was all about um, urban development and urban renewal and how it wasn't exactly what we thought it was going to be. <laughs> um, so I would like to, I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of speeding through. So maybe we have some time. I have about four minute video that I'd like to share with you, which leads us into the project that's in progress. Approaching unity, close to sunshine. Enoch George Howard was born enslaved. I've never seen his parents, Jack and Polly, nor have I seen Beale Gaither, his enslaver and supposed biological father. Would a photograph confirm the suspicion? Fact and knowledge don't always see eye to eye, but I'm still here looking for something beyond the page, some feeling guided by the record. To the land, the past is present. Corn and rye persist with soy thrown in for modern measure. The trees have kept watch, blitz around their roots, feeding wild rose brambles from long disintegrated remains. Did they recognize me when I came back? George and his wife Harriet came to own the land where they were enslaved. bought themselves, their children, and 300 acres with crop money saved up over years. This land, carefully stewarded, provided sustenance for generations of us, fertile ground to plant our own dreams in. 
One seed bloomed into paper, filled with stories of black love, firsts, lasts, and the ongoings of living Afro in America. It stretched across metal rods and folded itself into history, held our images within its pages, carried our words over oceans, offering itself as another record to guide us beyond the page. That's where I met Martha. The prettiest freckle-faced girl her husband had ever seen, clipped and pasted into a scrapbook nestled inside of its archival coffin. I've never seen her freckles, but they're clear as day beaming across my dad's face, a familiar constellation splashed across my own, another bridge between the seen and the known. She showed me where she labored as a girl enslaved, where she played to, showed me how she reworked death into more life, led me to documents that detailed the price of things but could never account for their true cost. Whispered to me through the silk, keep pulling until it all unravels. Now when I read maps with names that sound familiar, I know it's also family. Kin, like rose and black walnut, corn and rye. So I heard that some of you guys couldn't hear that really well. I'm sorry. I have a subtitled version of it, but I just added the wrong one into this presentation. Uh, but for a little bit of context, if you couldn't hear any of it, I was kind of recounting the story that I've learned about how Martha came to have this money. Um, and the story essentially goes that her father was given a piece of land to farm for himself. And when he would take the plantations crops into Baltimore, he would take his own, was able to sell them and keep the money and eventually bought himself and his family out of slavery, bought 300 acres of this land once the patriarch of that family died and the civil war was coming on. Um, and then from there amassed more land and you know gave portions of it to the black residents in, in, in that area to form a school and a church, but it also became you know, the financial basis for this company that is still in existence today. So it's really this trajectory of several generations um, told in a short narrative. So that was the project that I produced for Close Read, which is the projection that you saw on the front of that building. And it's the basis for an ongoing project. As I, as I uncover more information, I learned that even some of the things that I shared with you in that video were incorrect. So, you know, it becomes this thing where it's really about questioning um, all of the sources that we have as opposed to giving a one tightly packaged narrative. And so this will be my challenge as I continue to work on this project. And it's unfolding through a series of images like the ones that you see here. And we'll, you know, I love a book. So it's probably gonna be in a book at some point, but it'll probably also be an exhibition as well as um, some kind of, Ex experimental documentary of sorts. So this is what's in progress at the moment. The images combines sort of stage things, found, um, found situations like this um, little pergola here that says field of dreams, which I thought was really evocative. And then some arrangements that I'm making in studio as well. So I think that's it for me for now. I'd be really excited to hear questions from you guys about um, both my presentation and Rick's. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you for questions. So 
Um, kind of. You might need to repeat the question. We'll, yeah. Or you can come up and talk about it. Oh, mic. perfect. That'd be great. Rick sounds really clear. So. Okay. Sorry, I wasn't sure where the microphone is. Um, my name is Kelly Leilani Main. I'm a first year PhD student in the Landscape Architecture and Environmental Planning Program. And Savannah, one of the terms that you used in your talk was this idea of descriptive harm and how you actually manage, I guess, the, the difficulty of naming and describing without reproducing harm or, I guess, elaborating on those harms. And I was wondering if you could just speak a little bit more to that. And if, if Rick, you might also respond, I think, in any type of like archival work or storytelling, there's always this element of what are you describing and who is describing it and how is it being described? But Savannah, I'd like you to first maybe clarify what you meant by that and then maybe open up both to you on how to address that, um, I guess the do no harm challenge or if that's even an issue in storytelling. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, so the suggested but not ob obligatory reading that I sent out was from this archivist, Dorothy Berry. And one of the things that she talks about is working with collections that are based um, in black communities, but are collected and described by white institutions and how the way that they're described can make it really opaque for researchers to come behind them. So where there might've been a lot of context built into the image um, when it was in within its community where people would be able to identify who that person is, where that place is, when it gets to the institution, it just becomes Negro woman with child or, you know, like slave <laughs> and like, that's it. So I was talking more about um, these harmful objects that we were working with. And just if you were, a, you know, if you're a researcher and you have to encounter racialized terms that are outdated, outmoded and that you weren't expecting to be confronted with, that can be kind of jarring and um, unwelcoming as you're experiencing this collection. Um, so that's, in, in a, as a point of clarification, I hope that helps. That's what I was thinking about when I'm talking about descriptive harm, when you describe these actual objects and documents within a collection. And I'm not totally sure on how exactly to, um, to fix that because, you know, the, Rick mentioned this earlier, and I think it's a good point that part of the issue with this um, issue between with white organizations and institutions collecting black collections is that they typically are better resourced and have the finances to take these things on. And money is a big issue with archiving generally because it, you get a grant potentially to describe a collection um, and it's already in the past, but there's not so many grants at this moment to kind of redo that work because people don't take that as a priority. But that would be an amazing project to be able to go back into the collection and go label light by label and recategorize it based on updated terms. So for instance, when I'm talking about these women that we were trying to pull out who were um, black women suffragists in Baltimore and DC primarily, it was really hard to find them. You know, you had to do so many more layers of research in order to figure out who was their husband, what, you know, what where did, what street were they on, what clubs were they a part of, because so often they were not categorized under their own names. And so part of like the reparative work would be to go back in and to change these labels, these categorizations so that they're easier to find within the collection. Um, yeah, I think uh, Savannah kind of nailed it. I just wanted to add one more thing, which is there's many ways to enclose collections. They can be enclosed because they're held by institutions that don't want to make them accessible. They, they can be enclosed because they're not digitized and they can also be enclosed through bad or no description. Um, I'm working right now on, um, on, uh, on how people in the civil rights movement use two-way radio. And one of the things you see in the newspapers of the time is this refusal in the white press to engage with any of the terms by which civil rights workers or black power activists call themselves. So you have to look for outdated and derogatory terms in different contexts. Um, there's a great question for you in the chat, Savannah. Can you see that? That is a really great question. And um, I would say, 
it hasn't been super traumatic recently. I mean, I, I, most most of it hasn't been super traumatic because the histories that I've been able to find haven't been super traumatic, but they're, what I would say is like most frustrating about it, <laughs> is again, going back to this issue of women not being properly documented is that when I try to trace lineages back, I often get stopped at the women because they were not photographed in the same way. They weren't documented in the same way. So you can't actually access what their personhood was like. And that's not, I wouldn't call it traumatizing, but it's certainly frustrating um, when you're trying to build out a story that certainly includes these women, um, but there's, you know, there's no evidence of their existence beyond a, a grave marker, um, if that, you know? Um, so that's, I don't know. I don't know, Mike. I don't know that there. I would call any of it traumatic necessarily. Okay. Hi, it's me again. Um, I was wondering, one of the, not challenges, but I think really provocative issues with archival work that I've always in, encountered was um, being first brought up with the truth claim of photography and that you know, photographic image itself, somehow a representation of truth or reality, especially for the viewer. And so as archivist yourself, um, I was wondering if you could speak, I think, to the truth claims of different media and how, like, if you think one is more powerful or truthful than any other one, or how you, as an archivist, negotiate that truth claim kind of paradox um, mm -hmm. in a way for archival materials. Thank you, that's a really great question. Um, one thing I'll start with is that it's really amazing to work with a collection that was specifically compiled by Black people about Black people, because you don't run into quite as many um, instances where you're you're faced with like this miscategorization or a refusal to use terminology that would have been appropriate as Rick was mentioning. Um, but there, are, it's also a newspaper and it's really interesting to see where there were interventions into the images. So I didn't mention this project um, in this presentation, but I did a project a couple of years ago that actually took one image from the archives and zoomed in on it because there was sort of a um like a freehand analog photoshop happening where it was like slight interventions into the image where like then it was a presidential candidate came and visited the afro offices and there was this whole you know spread about it in the newspaper but in one of the images on the, on the outside of the building it didn't say afro anywhere but because they wanted to reinforce the brand somebody hand painted afro onto the side of the building like in basically what looks like whiteout and in a in a smaller intervention you know the people are moving quickly as they're printing photographs so you can imagine they don't make like a perfect photo for the newspaper so they had somebody come and retouch often and in the same image the outline between somebody's shoulder and somebody else's back is delineated with a black line there or in another section, it's like, there's just all of these little edits that will make the image pop better when it's reproduced in the actual newspaper. And so I run into that all the time, which I find to be really fascinating because it also then tells you something about the industry and tells you something about the processes um, that were used to get the image into a silver gelatin print onto a metal plate and then printed in the final newspaper that went out to thousands of people. And so, working through all of those things are really fascinating but the so the perspective that it's coming from the language that's used gives me a sense of the people in a way that feels truthful but i'm also keenly aware of the fact that the whole the whole reason why the black press exists is because it was you know essentially a propaganda machine to say you know as a, P a counter pr campaign in a way to say we are real people or not how you describe us and this is the way that we're going to prove that to you so if you think about like the editorial decisions that are made that's kind of going towards this mission of presenting black people as worthy of all of the rights um, that white people had so you know there's layers to unpack but when you have a framework for um for what the objectives were you can start to understand where 
truth isn't necessarily fiction, but it might be editorialized or it might be, you know, shaped a little bit differently. Um, Yeah, just real quick, um, you know, artists, archivists, uh, academics take great pleasure in problematizing images, but um, we don't usually present uncontextualized evidence to the public, and the public often sees or expects documentary truth when they see a historical image, and we need to, we need to, about how we present things. Did you, did you want us to take that question from Zoe? Yeah. Um, right, uh, different audiences see the same film in very different ways. So, you know, my, um, I have a very kind of uh, far out answer to this, which is that um, at, at, at the moment, at the beginning of this process, try not to overdetermine or pin down images too much, metadata, descriptive data I use homeopathically rather than overwhelmingly as a way of opening up perspectives, uh, you know, taking maybe an artist's point of view rather than trying to pin it down. I try not to upstage a historical image through over description or over context. That may be a, a privileged position, I don't know, but that's sort of my take. And that, by the way, is a great question. It is a great question. I, I would say I'm taking a different approach to metadata moving forward. Um, I mentioned that most of the images in the collection, which is about 3 million images, have the original captions on the back and they give a, a huge amount of information about what's going on in the image. And one of the things that we are working towards thinking about, you know, conceptualizing at this moment is how to create more complex relationships between these images, which are otherwise segmented and fractioned off basically into these different boxes and folders that are separate from each other. And so one of the things that I'm envisioning and hoping to have happen with a great deal of funding, which I'm sure we'll need to bring in, is to be able to have some sort of interface where if you had an image of, let's say six people and you only recognized Rosa Parks in the image, you could then click on another person who's in the image and find out about who that person is. Who's a part of um, Rosa Parks network? Who are the people who are surrounding her? What's the context that she's emerging from? And because we have such deep archives, we've covered so many different things from social events to birthday parties and all these things, the, the likelihood that we'd have information about that person is pretty high if it was an event that took place in one of the cities where we had papers. So, you know, I'm hoping to create a lot of connectivity between the images that are otherwise separated so that you get a fuller story of what might have been happening at the time. Um, so unfortunately we're out of time, but please help me um, say a big thank you again to Savannah. Thank you. So Rick and Savannah, um, one of our practices in the speaker series is small comment cards at the end of um, each session. And so that's a way for us also to say thank you for joining us um, and students share what their takeaway was or what their questions are. So I'll share that with you after I caught them. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. It was so great to see your faces in there. <laughs> and feel free to get in touch. I'm easy to find if any of you have follow up. Or if you need archival material, happy to help. Bye, Savannah. Great to see you again. Take care. Thank you.